Welcome to this session, which is the third session in a series about the current purges of the left in the Labour Party. So Neil, with help from others, has run two other sessions about this. And this session brings the purges analysis bang up to date with the proscriptions, but also includes further information on different aspects of the purges. So we're going to hear um, from Neil about the timeline. We're going to hear about the weaponization of anti-Semitism. We're going to hear about how targeted some groups and individuals have been. We're going to hear about the media and the smear campaign. And we're also going to hear about the failure in terms of natural justice in the way that the party is carrying out the purges. And finally, we'll be hearing about the financial cost of the purges. So first of all, all the way from Australia, um, we're going to hear from Professor Neil Todd, who's going to start off with the witch hunt timeline. Over to you, Neil. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. OK. Can you see my slides? Yeah. OK. Yes, we can. OK, excellent. OK, so um, many thanks to the organisers for making this event possible. I know they've done a lot of work um, behind the scenes. Thank you all the speakers uh, today who've agreed to participate. We're talking about different aspects of the purge. Um, <clears throat> as Esther said, this is the third in the series, um, tracking the great purge that's going on. Um, it's a very fast moving target. Um, so any publications which follow, and I've written two for the Labour briefing, are already out of date by the time they get published. Um, so my role today, as before, will be to give an overview of, the, of this evolving, extraordinary process. Um, so um, the first thing I think it's important to do is to establish at the outset exactly the extent, the extent of it. Um, we know there's been a massive acceleration in the last couple of months, as, you know, with proscriptions, etc. But exactly how many have there been? Um, now, one simple way to estimate that is by the use of case numbers, an example of which you can see here, which is from my own case going back to 2019. The Labour Party Governance and Legal Unit, or GLU, has posted out many thousands of these letters over the last several years. And since mid-2018, they've been using a numbering system to identify the individual cases. And you can see here, you get a case number and a date. Okay, now over the last Six months, I've been collecting these, a bit, a bit like a train spotter, I've been collecting these numbers and seeing what they, they mean. So the next slide shows you um, and the case numbers against date over the last uh, four years. Um, and what you can see is that there is this extraordinary growth rate. The very first point here is actually my case going back to 2019. Now you would be forgiven by looking at this graph of doing a double take and mistaking it for a typical COVID wave um, because the case numbers have, in fact, literally taken on an exponential form, uh, especially over the last couple of months. Actually, I think an analogy to a pandemic is quite apt in the same way that one catches the COVID virus by close proximity to an affiliated, an, a, 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 an afflicted individual. Any association with the victim of this current witch hunt is also like to increase their chances of becoming infected themselves, especially um, as many have found out by showing support for their friends and comrades. Insidiously, it forces a Kafkaesque lockdown mentality with many in order to avoid becoming victims themselves into practicing self-policing and to coin a phrase, socialist distancing. Now the shape of the graph confirms that um, the, uh, the numbers have grown from about 6,000 at the end of last year when the officer suspensions took place and have, have more than doubled in number to, to August, reaching 13,000 in mid-August when the first notices of possible um, auto-exclusion were, were dispatched. Now, at this rate, uh, the purge is on course to claim as many as 20,000 victims by the end of 2021. Um, but like all pandemic, it will eventually come to an end when the curve will flatten out, when it runs out of victims. Okay, so the next thing is, um, how, how did we get here? Um, and what this next slide shows is um, uh, 
against the background of the growth in case numbers, um, uh, the key points, which I believe can be traced at least back to the Gaza War of 2014. And I believe the case is clear that what we are witnessing in this purge is a wider war by apartheid Israel, as I will show. Now, going back to 2014, in response to the outrage caused by the 2014, 2014 Gaza War around the war and the bad plus publicity, it was about this time that the Israeli Strategic Affairs Ministry declared a global war against the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. Its chosen weapon was, of course, uh, false allegations of anti-Semitism to be cross prosecuted by a network of lobby groups set up around the world, all with close links to the Israeli embassy. Um, <clears throat> so shortly uh, during the period of the Gaza War, uh, one a notorious lobby group called the so-called Campaign for anti Against Anti-Semitism, which has been central to the witch hunt, was founded in 2014 with the aim of smearing, smearing Palestinian rights campaigners. The CIA has been referred to a Zionist hate group with a special hatred, it appears, directed against Jews who oppose the Zionist racist ideology. And it speaks volumes that one of its first targets was the Jewish Labour MP, Gerald Kaufman. The following year, 2015, Corbyn was elected as the leader of the Labour Party. And literally the day after, uh, a hitherto moribund group, the, the so-called Jewish Labour Movement, in reality, a Zionist anti-Labour movement, was refounded to oppose the Corbyn and Sanders movements. And this was evidenced by being captured on camera by an Al Jazeera reporter. Its purpose was to prevent the election of a socialist Labour government with an ethical policy seen as a threat to apartheid Israel. In 2016, despite the um, chicken coup uh, led by right-wing Labour MPs, um, Corbyn was re-elected. During this year, another lobby group, the so-called Labour Against Antisemitism, was founded, made up of a network of fanatical thugs. Its, its sole purpose as a self-appointed Stasi was to terrorise and smear Labour activists with fake um, allegations. 2017 saw the exposure of the Israeli spy Shai Masot in the Al Jazeera documentary, The Lobby, caught on camera handing out a wadge of cash to yet another lobby group, Labour Friends of Israel. Masot was expelled from the UK after working to take down MPs who were critical of Israel, including the Conservative Alan Duncan. So it wasn't just Labour, it was anybody who was critical of Israel. Um, 2018, of course, saw the first expulsions, um, the well-known cases, Tony Greenstein, Jackie Walker, Mark Wadsworth, two of whom were Jewish, uh, followed by the hounding of Ken Livingstone and Chris Williamson, who sought to defend these early victims. But it was by autumn in this hysterical atmosphere that had been whipped up by the various uh, Zionist groups, um, the uh, party capitulated by adopting the bogus IHRA so-called definition, thus uh, further enabling uh, the mass production of fake anti-Semitism smears. And it was shortly after this that the cases started rising significantly. My own case dated from around that time after successfully sponsoring a resolution at Exeter, posing at IHRA and supporting Mark. 2019, in the moral panic of the crisis, so-called crisis, the party capitulated once again by introducing so-called fast track rules, allowing the NEC to expel without a hearing. Only supposed to be used for most egregious cases, as widely predicted, it became the dominant mode of action, uh, adding indeed extra impetus to the growing cases. It also led to the sidelining of the National Constitutional Committee, which had been set up um, in the 1980s following successful legal challenges during the Kinnick witch hunt. This is an issue which is, um, I'm very familiar with, having been one of those who was involved in the legal cases in 1986. Um, <clears throat> We're going to hear more about that in shortly. Um, then 2019, of course, saw the CIA, JLM submit their fake allegations to uh, EHRC and, of course, the defeat of Corbyn's Labour. Um, <clears throat> 2020 uh, saw the rise of um, Sir Keir. I support Zionism without qualification. Starmer with the appointment of David Evans as General Secretary and the control of the NEC taken over by the Zionist right including the self-declared Zionist shit lord, Luke Akerst, a professional Israel lobbyist. Uh, that, of course, having controlled the N taken control of the NEC, they could then exploit so-called fast-track procedures. 
Then in 2021, the purge now in full swing. Remarkably, Starmer appointed the former, another Israeli spy, uh, Shai um, Asaf Kaplan, um, to monitor social media. Now, despite the abusive procedure by the right-controlled NEC, it still wasn't enough to purge members fast enough to get through the huge back of cases, the back of cases now 10 to 10,000. So Evans hired an army, a small army of casual snoopers after sacking dozens of staff uh, following the near bankruptcy of the party. And then the most recent maneuver prescribed number of groups, thus allowing auto exclusions. Okay, in this final slide, I just wanna make a few connections, final connections between those issues I've drawn together. Um, so in the blue corner here, you have the, the various Israel lobby groups um, and their allies on the right wing of the Labour Party. Um, this includes, of course, the Board of Deputies, which now admits on its website that it has links to the Israeli Strategic Affairs Ministry. So it's completely open. There's no um, secret about that. Between them, these lobby groups have manufactured on an industrial scale, literally tens of thousands of fake anti-Semitism complaints, which have been fed into Labour's Kafkaesque uh, uh, gov governance and legal unit. The governance and legal is, 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 of course, pointed by David Evans. It's not, it's not impartial. It's not a neutral investigatory body. And we know for the fact that Starm has ordered individuals and groups to be targeted on more, more than one occasion on instructions from the Board of Deputies and other lobby groups which come up with their own hit lists. Uh, the glue systematically leaks confidential information to the right-wing media, uh, including the Jewish Chronicle, which we'll hear about shortly, thus facilitating its campaign of lies and smears via their gutter hacks, such as Lee Harpin, who was involved in the phone hacking scandal. We then have the adjudicators, so-called adjudicators in the form of the NEC and the NCC, or at least it was until it was sidelined by the right controlled NEC. And let, let's face it, come on, with the likes of Israel lobbyist, BICOM lobbyist, Luke Akerst on this body, can anybody believe you're gonna get a fair hearing? Um, it's clear that the way in which it's been operated has nothing to do with natural justice. It is pure naked abuse of power for factional ends. It should also be clear um, that the various agents in these, these various in this quasi-judicial process are not independent. They're all linked together in the various networks. And this, the recent maneuvering, the replacement of the NEC with this so-called independent board appointed by David Evans, of course, uh, is, is completely uh, non-independent. Finally, this is my last point, uh, Chair, and nearly winding up. Um, in the red corner, we have the victims, now tens of thousands, mainly ordinary party members, who have expressed opinion critical of apartheid Israel, or even just critical of David Evans and Keir Starmer. Val Spalker then were 2015 joiners or rejoiners, inspired by the mild program put forward by Jerry Program. Many of them have been very badly affected by the appalling treatment at the hands of the, the Zionist thugs who have become the self-appointed Stasi to the Star of Evans' reign of terror, the anonymous agents of the glue, or the media hacks who pour out the lies and smears. It's becoming increasingly apparent also, as we will hear, that a disproportionate number of the victims are themselves Jewish, which should have, if nothing else, confirmed that this purge has little or nothing to do with genuine anti-Semitism, but rather the protection of apartheid Israel. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just gonna wind up now, I'll hand up over to the other speakers. Um, I'm sure that some things I've said here, you probably may not agree, all agree with, but I hope that one thing unites us all here in this room is a desire to see the truth told about this monstrous purge and for justice to be done for the now many thousands of its victims. Truth and justice, it seems such a cliche to call for these, but these are increasingly rare commodities in this era with truth, truth politics, not least in the Labour Party of the deceitful and treacherous Sir Keir Starmer, the man who told a pack of lies to be elected and then stabbed his former comrades in the back. But I for one, and I'm sure everybody in, in this platform will not be cowed or silenced by this appalling attitude. We, we will continue to tell the truth and seek justice. Thank you. Thank you, Neil, for the massive 
amount of work that you've done on this. Thank you. And um, we'll pick some issues up in the questions, I'm sure, later. So next we have Naomi. Naomi Wimborne Adrissi, you're going to talk to us about the targeting of groups and individuals in the purges for around 15 minutes. Thank you, Naomi. Is this working? Yes, it seems to be great. Sorry to have to turn my back on. Well, it's funny, it's a funny feeling, you know. Trying to look at my fellow panelists and then I'm turning my back on you. Um, yes, Neil's work is extraordinarily impressive, I must say. And I, I, I'd like him to tell us a bit more about those numbers because uh, if you reckon, is it 13,000 people expelled? I don't think that you mean targeted in some way, I assume. 13,000 people. Cases, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's I just wanted to make that clear. <laughs> Thanks. We'll come back to that, I'm sure. Um, so, I, I want to start, I'm very impressed with what he's put up here. I just want a little bit of a caveat. Um, of course, there are agents of the Israeli state who are involved in this war against the left in Britain. And there are, that, that's, that's graphic that she showed us most recently with a network of, of individuals and organizations it is, is factual, but I wouldn't want people to get the impression that the whole apparatus is controlled from Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. I mean, let, let's be clear about this. Israel is making great play of this issue and they're benefiting enormously from it. But basically we have the entire British establishment against us. I think it's very clear that, you know, their role is as an aid to the British, the financial, military, media, political establishment. And that's been quite clear from the beginning. So my job is to look at targeting and it's quite a patchy picture. There's there been so many different kinds of victims of this purge that um, I, I'm only going to pick out a few examples and try and find some sort of pattern. So Neil already mentioned that some of the early victims, including two Jewish comrades, Tony Greenstein and Jackie Walker, but also including Ken Livingstone, Mark Wadsworth, eventually uh, Chris Williamson and so on. But right at the beginning, before that began, when Jeremy's name appeared on the ballot paper, people may remember that there were accusations in the media. We've got the, this man is a Czech spy. Do you remember? Yeah. Allegations against Jeremy that he is a security threat. You had senior military figures suggesting that they might need to mount a coup if Corbyn were ever to reach Downing Street. You had John McDonald being described as a terrorist sympathizer, digging up his uh, past sympathies with Irish republicanism and so on. So this was the establishment gearing up right from the beginning, without the benefit of a host of anti-Semitism allegations at their, at their beck and call, to destroy even the tiniest hint of a potential movement of the left being in a position to take some, some sort of control, some sort of power, have power and influence in British society. So um, I, I think it's really important that we, we're very clear about, about that being the, the, the basic background to all this. Um, I'm very keen to use an example of one of the early victims, uh, a comrade of mine from Waltham Forest in northeast London, um, a chap called David Watson, who's a history uh, secondary school teacher. Um, David had the misfortune to come up against um, Stella Creasy MP for Walthamstow, who is very much on the Blairite wing of the party, um, who runs a sort of fam local mafia which very much aligned to what we can now see as Keir Starmer's project and, uh, and position in the party. But at, at that time, um, just to explain a little bit, Walthamstow has Stella Creasy, um, Ilford South, which is Ilford North, which is next door, has uh, Wes Streeting, another person who's been involved in all this and well known to all of you. Ilford South had at that point Mike Gapes, who jumped ship. And in the middle, was Chingford and Wolfford Green, my constituency, where the MP is Ian Duncan Smith. And the left, as Jeremy uh, became more, more of a force and more of us joined and people on the left started to get involved, that, that party very quickly became a, a sort of target for the right because I was the vice, I became the vice chair. We had a very left wing chair. It was taken over by the left. And it's kind of, it's like Stella, Wes, 
and pre previously Mike Gapes, now he's now gone, replaced by Sam Tarry, which is progress. Um, they, they were trying to build this kind of, um, I don't know, a sort of fiefdom in that part of Northeast London. And they didn't, they didn't want, where they had control, they were determined to maintain it. So this guy, David Watson, stood as um, campaign organizer, a fundraising organizer against Stella Creasy's mother. And he had the temerity to win the vote. Within days, David gets a call from the Jewish Chronicle saying, mm, you've been suspended from the Labour Party. And he's saying, what, why? And they dug up some Facebook posts sympathetic to, to Palestine, critical of Israel. And uh, he had indeed been suspended. He got the letter from Stella Creasy's dad, Phil Creasy, who is the secretary of the constituency party, uh, suspending him. That was in early 2016. David did not get a hearing until the end of 2019, right, just before the general election. His case finally went to the NCC. There was lots of people campaigning for him. He wrote innumerable letters. He got people like Anne Black, who the one thing she's good for is she likes to, uh, she gets upset about delay. You know, she, she gets very upset about that. Not, not much else, but that's, that's, that's upset. Um, and so she put a word for him, but it took three and a half years and there he is. So this man is a target, just an individual, not a member of any of the, the left groups or anything. He gets a hearing, the NCC look at his case and say, well, it's ridiculous. You know, he obviously deserves to be a member. Reinstated, within a couple of weeks, another suspension letter arrives with no, no additional charges, just we've decided to suspend you, suspend you again. Um, the only communication he had for a while was um, a letter saying, you cannot vote in the leadership election because by this time Jeremy had lost the election. And just reminding you, you cannot vote in the leadership election, right? <laughs> then he mysteriously got another letter saying that you're back in. And he moved to my constituency, he's now a member of my constituency. Um, and now he's been also excluded. He was expelled the week before last. So, I mean, if you want to talk about targeting of individual, is it is just hounding of this person who is completely inoffensive I and mean, his main claim to fame previously was being a, a very um, active campaigner as a fundraiser for the campaign against arms trade he used to run and raise thousands of pounds and things like that so targeting of individuals why he was on the wrong side of a right-wing Labour MP who didn't want to broke to broke any dissent within her, her, her party so this is she was tapping into the machine there Right, the leaked report revelations, which we have to assume are true, probably why we're not hearing from the Ford report, it's been delayed again, uh, was meant to go to the NEC um, in September, hasn't happened, it's now going to be October or November, and then it'll be only a partial release of whatever it is the Ford inquiry has come up with. So but the leaked report was very interesting because it revealed some of the other targeting that had gone on. Um, one of those given quite a lot of prominence in that leaked report was um, JVL's national secretary, Glyn Secker, who, and, the, and again, this is interesting, he's in Dulwich and West Norwood Labour Party. Um, forgive me if I get my years mixed up, but we are probably talking 2018. Yeah, is that right? I think when Dulwich and West Norwood left, managed to take control of the constituency Labour Party. So again, this is this is a left right battle we're talking about. No direct involvement from Tel Aviv or Street Affairs Ministry. Anything. Very soon after that, Glynn was suspended. Right. And he was very clear that he was suspended because he was representative of this left grouping which had taken control of the party. But he was suspended because his name appeared in a document produced by David Collier, who is one of the people in uh, Neil's sort of uh, yeah, yeah, system of control, sort of uh, intervention there from the right, um, who'd done the hatchet job on a, a Facebook page called Palestine Live, which did have a bit of dubious stuff going on in it, it has to be admitted. But Glynn was named on it because the organiser of the Facebook group, she liked to just sort of sign people up, you know what I mean? You can be, you can be named. Glynn had never posted to it, and Collier actually said in his report Glyn Secker does not appear to have been posted, but this wasn't the fact that his name was in Collier's report was enough for the governance and legal unit to suspend him. There was an outcry, of course. What are you doing? Uh, uh, what are you doing? Suspending a Jewish 
anti-racist activist and they they rescinded it but th th there was a huge furore about this and Seamus Milne got in trouble in that awful is labor anti-semitic panorama program um, because he point he had pointed out that if they were going to be expelling Jews or disciplining Jews they better have a bloody good reason for it and it was Glynn's case he was talking about apparently um, and this was this was put forward as Jeremy Corbyn's team interfering you know, I mean, the way these things are distorted. So that was another time. Another thing that, uh, another sort of targeting that is revealed in the leaked report is um, Saeed Siddiqui. So a lot of these people are in my, I must be a bit, bit of a, <laughs> what, what's the word? Yeah, something like that. So Saeed is in Ilford South. Um, he had a row with a right-wing um, council candidate who, you've got this sort of Bangladeshi versus Sikh thing going on. Um, the, the other individual concerned, who's now leader of the council, I fear, um, is from the Sikh faction and Saeed is Bangladeshi. They had a row. Uh, Saeed was abused. He complained about the abuse, racial abuse, drunken racial abuse on a phone call that he recorded late at night. Um, and his, his complaint was, of course, ignored. And then counter complaints started to be made against him. So this whole catalogue of stuff about Saeed being a bully, totally concocted, totally concocted stuff. They built up a case against him, suspended him. He had a hearing which Sir Geoffrey Byman QC attended as a sort of silent witness for Saeed. And he pronounced afterwards that this was not just a star chamber, it was like a kind of Stasi inquisition. He'd never sat for six hours, six hours, as a result of which Saeed just remained suspended. It just went on and on extraordinary. He's now, by the way, the leader of the wonderful Bangladesh Social Society, which had its launch dinner last night. It was really great. So good on them. But this is a young Bangladeshi health worker, incredibly dedicated. He was secretary of the CLP, lost that role. This is the sort of person who's being targeted. I mean, how much time have I got left? Because there's so many. Mm, right, I'll just have to run through. I mean, I'll just sort of throw out some mentions. I mean, Saeed is an example of one of the Muslim comrades who've been targeted. A lot of people uh, in that category have faced this sort of uh, harassment and intimidation from the machine. Um, Waver Tree 4, remember the uh, Liverpool constituency where four comrades were uh, suspended, two have since been expelled as a result of an altercation with their new MP, left-wing backed MP, who nonetheless felt that when she came, uh, when she took, uh, took office, her first thing she had to do was write a groveling thing in a local paper saying how she terribly missed uh, Luciana Berger, who she'd taken over from, and she had a big job to do, you know, uh, making friends again with the Jewish community who was so hurt, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, so one of those four comrades was, uh, was Muslim. Uh, when the Peterborough cases came out early this year, in the late, one of the latest waves that Neil indicated, there were 19 Labour Party members suspended over a period of several weeks. A number of them were Muslim councillors or council candidates. And when a group of those people whose names were dragged through the mire, pictures in the local press with the headline, a stain on our city, because of these suspensions, many of them with anti-Semitism allegations, I've nearly finished Esther. <laughs> uh, some of them, many of them were Muslims. And when a number of those people very bravely wrote a letter, which was, was published in the Peterborough Telegraph to give them credit, none of the Muslim councillors or council candidates dared put their name to it. They feel totally cowed. I and mean, what can you do if you're a Muslim, facing Islamophobia every day in your life and you're accused of anti-Semitism in public. It's extraordinary harassment and intimidation. I wanna just throw in the name Joe Bird. You'll know about Joe Bird, JVL member, councillor in the Wirral, young Jewish woman. She's now had disciplinary action against her four times in two and a half years. The first was her suspension when she was standing in the NEC by-election yeah, in early, early 2019. The latest, she's now had an auto exclusion letter. Okay. So, I mean, the machine is against us. The machine is out to drive out the left. And the weaponization of anti Semitism has served them very well. 
but let's not get carried away with the idea that it's sort of there's a puppet master in in Tel Aviv controlling it all. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Thanks very much. Anyway, and I look forward to the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naim, and solidarity with you. Um, I really get the issue of being on the wrong side of a right wing MP. We see that a lot in the Southwest. Um, it's important and significant and interesting. So next we're going, um, we're going to hear from Brian Cathcart. I don't know exactly where you are, Brian. I'm sure you'll tell us. Um, you're, um, <laughs> yes, can we make Brian bigger? <laughs> Brian is um, Professor of Journalism. Um, he's one of the founders of the Hacked Off Press Reform Campaign Group. And Brian is going to talk to us today about the media and the smear campaign. Over to you, Brian, and we're going to try and make you bigger. Can you help? Are you, are you, okay, yeah, if you start talking, you'll suddenly get bigger. Carry on, Brian. Thank you. Excellent. Not many people ask for me to be bigger, but there we are. Um, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I, can I, I'd just like to start by making a couple of things clear. Um, I'm, I, I can't be thrown out of the Labour Party for associating with the wrong people because I'm not a member of the Labour Party and never have been. Um, and I'm not particularly active in, um, in Palestine-Israeli issues. Um, and not that I don't have my views. Um, I, I'm here, I was invited to participate because of my engagement with press reform issues. And um, I, I want to talk about, uh, rather as Naomi has, about specific, uh, a specific uh, case study, as it were, in um, uh, w which concerns me, which will obviously for you have uh, important uh, reflections on the issue of the, of the meeting. So this is about the Jewish Chronicle and it's, it's um, the collapse of uh, what I consider the collapse of journalistic standards at the Jewish Chronicle in the course of their campaign about uh, anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. So just a little background, for, uh, you probably all know this, but I'm, I'll just fill it in, is that at the press, um, uh, we know about the Leveson inquiry, the Labour Party is very loyal to supporting the idea of the Leveson reforms, uh, voted for them when they came in, 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 in before Parliament, and um, uh, uh, subsequently um, uh, maintained the support for the reforms in, uh, in its um, uh, manifestos. Um, the, uh, the reforms um, were a, a measure intended to raise standards um, and protect the public. Um, and it's my view that actually one of the gravest problems in, in UK society today is press dishonesty. Um, I think that if we had a, an honestly informed public, we would have a very different country. And uh, I've, I've given up um, trying to decide um, whether uh, you know, the press or the politicians lead in the disinformation because I actually think they're effectively the same thing. So just to come to the Jewish Chronicle um, in this picture, uh, the, the first case that came before Ipso relating to the Jewish Chronicle um, happened in 2018. Um, I don't tend to identify um, uh, complainants, I'll just uh, partly because it kind of perpetuates the, the harm that's done and, and harm is where these, you know, is, the, is key in all these things. Um, but this, this complainant was accused of being a um, Holocaust denier. Um, actually, um, he ran a, uh, a website, uh, a commenter on the website referred to a leaflet. Um, and uh, the leaflet had some uh, content relating to Holocaust denial. And he put on his website, I don't know this leaflet effectively. Um, on that basis, he was accused of saying he didn't know whether there'd been a Holocaust or whether the Jews had died in the Holocaust. And, and, and uh, he took this uh, to Ipso and uh, Ipso upheld his complaint. Uh, that's to say it found that he was accurate, he was correct, and that the Jewish Chronicle had uh, breached the code. Now, to pause there, Ipso is a wholly inadequate regulator. It's not a regulator at all in practice. It is a kind of fence um, uh, to protect the, the, the national 
corporate press. Um, and Ipso very rarely finds against a, a, a member of any kind. Uh, it's an extremely hard to reach the threshold. In fact, it, it's false to speak of a threshold because uh, the, it's almost arbitrary when the rare occasions arise when there's a breach. Um, uh, so for that complainant to have got a finding in his favor was pretty remarkable. Um, in, that was July 18, in March 2019, there was another complaint, a much more complex complaint um, by an author who, uh, who's, um, who was described as a, a hate author um, and who uh, had, a, um, it related to two meetings um, uh, which he either addressed or which which uh, were uh, were in one case postponed, which were presented as having been cancelled uh, because of his views, and uh, he was able to prove quite satisfactorily that neither of these meetings had been cancelled because of his views. In fact, um, you know he 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 was able to find endorsements to his 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 opinion from the people involved in 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 setting up the meetings, uh, but the. Um, uh, the Jewish Chronicle had simply reported uh, this uh, on the basis of the word um, of somebody from the Board of Deputies, and this was never challenged, it was reported as fact, and the IPSO once again found that it was um, false. There were four breaches of the code. Now again, a little parenthesis. The editor's code of conduct is actually written by editors. It's, it's not, doesn't begin to meet the threshold of of, of independence and effectiveness that Levison would have liked, um, uh, but it is, it's a code and its first line is um, the press shall take care not to publish um, information that is um, uh, misleading, uh, distorted or inaccurate. Now, you might pause to laugh at that because um, it's, it's, it's not a picture we recognize, but that is the first line of the code. And this was, there were breaches of the code here, four breaches in this second case in March, 2019. Now I'm not gonna plow through them all, but the next one is pivotal. And that's in November, 2019. And it's a complaint that ends up with Ipso finding 10 breaches, 10 times in the relation to four articles about this person, um, Ipso had breached the code. It, it simply, simply lies. Um, uh, the complainant was able to disprove categorically all of these things. And the categorical disproof helps explain why Ipso was finding against uh, a, a member in this case, because it's really very, very difficult to, 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 to get, as I can't stress it enough, to get findings of, of breaches of the code. Now, so, and they, that was a key date, November, the ruling was in November 2019. So um, uh, egregious was the behavior of um, the Jewish Chronicle in relation to these complaints uh, that the Ipso Complaints Committee did something unprecedented. It referred the matter to Ipso's standards department. Now, if you believe Ipso, and I rarely do, if the, the standards department is a kind of like a, a coiled spring, ready to jump into action um, to uh, tackle um, uh, problems in, in, in the press. Well, what happened? What happened when it was, the paper was actually referred to the standards department? <clears throat> well, um, we understand from uh, the Jewish Chronicle's own reports to Ipso, that uh, there was an exchange of uh, communication on emails or phone calls or something, and an offer was made to uh, the Jewish Chronicle to have a bit of training. Now, if you think this is, this is not a disciplinary, you know, it's explicitly an offer, not an order. You don't have to take any training. You can, you can have training. In fact, the training never happened because uh, it wasn't convenient for the Jewish Chronicle. Um, there was also discussion of a possible meeting and the meeting was shelved because of um, uh, COVID lockdown. So the outcome of this referral to the standards department was zero. And it's kind of worse than that in several ways um, because the, not, not only did neither the meeting nor the training take place, 
But when the complainant wrote again to say, what's happened as a result of this referral to the Standards Committee? She never got a reply. Only recently, when she wrote again, did they say to her, well, um, uh, actually, um, you know, the, somebody left the, um, the, the organization and uh, the, I'm afraid the correspondence got dropped. That's, it's, it's not an excuse. But it, it, again, it's even worse than that because what should really have happened was a muscular investigation of what was going wrong at the Jewish Chronicle. And when I say what should really have happened, we know that's what really should have happened because the sequel is a whole series of further complaints and findings against the uh, Jewish Chronicle. And the sequence, I won't run through them. The sequence continues until, and you've heard her name mentioned uh, by Naomi, the sequence continues until the case of Joe Bird this summer. And Joe, with whom I've been in, in communication, has um, written to um, uh, Ipso to say, look, you've, mine is only the latest of many findings uh, that the Jewish Chronicle has failed. Um, are you going to mount a standards investigation, a formal standards investigation? This is something that Ipso has never done in its seven year existence. It was one of the principles of um, what well, was one of the recommendations of Leveson that there should be um, uh, effective uh, powers of investigation. It was because the, the old press ca complaints committee commission never investigated phone hacking uh, that, they, that, that um, it, it lost all its credit. Uh, so there had to be powers of investigation. So um, when, they, when the press set up Ipso, they, they say it's got powers of investigation. They say it's the toughest regulator in the Western world, that's back in 2014. Um, uh, but in fact, it's hamstrung. The, the powers to investigate are very shackled. And in particular, the threshold is very high. It has to be both serious and systemic, and they have their own ways of, of defining systemic. So no investigation, formal investigation takes place uh, back in, the, in November 2019, that significant date and no investigation to date. And there are now 33 recorded code breaches in I think it's eight complaint series. Worse than that, at, in the same period, that three year period, there are also four instances of the Jewish Chronicle paying, uh, accepting that it has libeled somebody and paying in a settlement, paying damages and issuing apologies, four. And three of those relate to um, people, uh, anti-Semitism claims in the Labour Party. So you have, by anybody's standards, surely, given the high threshold of, 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 uh, uh, of, that you have to achieve to, to get a finding against a paper at Ipso, by any standards, you have categorical proof of a collapse of standards at the Jewish Chronicle. You have what's more proof that it is, um, uh, it doesn't care. Um, nothing has changed. Uh, the, 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 the latest complainant, when he first wrote to uh, Ipsa, to rather to the Jewish Chronicle, because it's normal to raise your complaints there first, the latest complainant got a reply saying, uh, Thank you for your email. It's the most ludicrous I've ever written, I've ever read. This is from the editor of the Jewish Chronicle. This is not taking complaints seriously. It's not showing any kind of concern that you need to be, the journalists need to be accurate. Now, for me as a journalist, and as somebody who's taught journalists, this is a heartbreaking breach of what we're supposed to be about. I mean, we were talking about truth earlier. Truth is actually, you know, central to everything every journalist should be doing. It, you know, we can't, as journalists, always present the truth but the, um, there's a useful um, definition of journalism, which says it's, it's the best approximation of the truth you can manage in the available time. This is, this is just a, an outrage. But from your purposes, for your purposes, you know, the, 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 the thing, the whole thing has a, has, a, um, has a different dimension and I appreciate that. What they've done is they have mounted a campaign they have mounted a campaign and discarded all the usual um, journalistic 
um, the thresholds, all the unit, uh, caveats, all the, all the care that goes into journalism while mounting this campaign. And you know, it, it fits into the pattern of this meeting that they should have done so um, you know, recklessly. Um, what doesn't fit into the pattern of this meeting, or uh, maybe Naomi would disagree with me, is that, is that you know, there's, there is no possible justification for Ipso not investigating them. And yet, um, I think it's now nine weeks since um, Joe Bird wrote to them. Um, uh, seven of the other, or was it eight of the other um, uh, victims or targets of the, um, of the Jewish Chronicle who'd had upheld complaints, um, wrote to them too. At the same time, they, 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 there are now, I think, 10 people uh, urging in that, in that status, urging Ipso to act, they won't. Um, so we come back to that thing, you know, uh, where, is, where is the barrier? And, and, and you know, this, this affects the rest of the press because, of course, as you know, the, this resonates, the stuff coming from the Jewish Chronicle resonated through the coverage in the Daily Telegraph, the Times, the Mail, the Express, and so on. Um, uh, if Ipso had acted when it should have in, 20, in 2019, um, at least some of this damage would not have occurred, but damage both to individuals and to our public life, which is being poisoned by lies. It's, it's not just in this instance. If you go to the Hacked Off website, you'll see that there's a very strong case for a standards investigation into the Times for its coverage of Muslims, um, for, into the Daily Telegraph for its coverage of science issues, for into the um, uh, mail for its, its bullying of individuals, particularly women. Um, they, there's a whole string of them, um, but uh, Ipso has never done any investigating, and it is, as I say, poisoning the uh, bloodstream of our, our political life. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so, very grateful to you. Thank you. So, we do actually have Roger. Um, I couldn't see properly. Um, Roger, would you like to come and join us on, on the stage? Um, so, so Roger's a lifelong socialist activist. He's a member of Newham Socialist Labour that we've just oh, heard about from Corral. And he's currently, like many of us, under threat of auto-exclusion. Um, Roger's going to talk about the weaponization of anti-Semitism. Thank you, Roger. All right, uh, thank you, comrades. I, uh, it's, uh, you know, I would say, uh, you know, all the speakers we've had so far are very hard acts to follow, and I know there are other comrades here, including comrades like David Rosenberg, Tony Greenstein, Leah Levain, etc., who would be perhaps even better qualified than me to speak about this. But I would like to say that, like many of us here, I do know something about anti-Semitism. Um, I don't have any ancestors, as far as I know, in uh, who were in Auschwitz, but my grandfathers, both uh, Fred Pogroms and grandmothers, Fred Pogroms in the Russian Empire. My, uh, my dad's father came with his brother, struggled across Europe, fleeing, uh, fleeing pogroms in Romania, and uh, got stuck in Liverpool. They didn't have the fare. Uh, to, to cross in, cross to America, they spun a coin and my grandfather lost, and I'm rather glad that he did, so here I am. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my mother's father, uh, a similar story, came from Ukraine, and uh, soon after he arrived in uh, Liverpool, his body was found floating in the River Mersey, probably uh, it was assumed the victim of an anti-Semitic uh, murder. But more important, I know something else from my family history, and that's about the Labour Party's record uh, in relation to anti-Semitism. Because, um, I, I, again, I apologise for talking about my family history, but my dad, who was a, um, a long-time Labour MP, and by the way, himself uh, twice expelled from the, from the Parliamentary Party for defying the leadership, and was uh, jailed during the First World War uh, as a war resistor, went on hunger strike in jail, fought all his life for the victimized and the persecuted, and he became head of the World Jewish Congress in Britain at the outset of the Second World War. And in that capacity, he received the very first warnings of the impending Holocaust, and he desperately fought 
for the right of asylum and refuge in, uh, in uh, Britain. And in that fight, he came right up against the Labour leadership. He fought the blatantly, blatantly anti-Semitic and literally murderous policies of Labour's right wing at the time. The Home Secretary at the time, uh, during the coalition government, was Herbert Morrison, the grandfather, by the way, of uh, somebody called Peter Mandelson. <laughs> and he, um, he was personally instrumental in blocking entry to Jews who were fleeing the Holocaust. I, I found a quote in a book called Whitehall and the Jews, 1933 to 1948. And the quote is this, British immigration policy throughout that period was designed to keep out large numbers of European Jews, perhaps 10 times as many as it let in. So when they boast about uh, how they flung open the doors and gave the right of asylum, please keep that quote in mind. But that's not the only, um, that's not the only example. In the, when it came to the uh, post-war Labour government in 1945, uh, the Foreign Secretary was Ernest Bevin, who um, just in the same way that migrants crossing the Mediterranean, Mediterranean now uh, have, are being drowned, by the policies of uh, European uh, European governments. So then too, migrants making the same journey in the opposite direction, people who were fleeing from displaced persons internment camps, survivors of the concentration camps who had no homes to go back to, who, um, who uh, whose whole families and uh, friendship circles and communities have been utterly not, not well annihilated. They were looking for somewhere to live, and they were seeking a homeland in Palestine. And they were not, uh, you know, ideological Zionists. They weren't there to establish a state. They want their, they were they were fleeing there because they were desperate to find somewhere to live. And Ernest Bevin sank them in the Mediterranean, uh, just as we're seeing now. And uh, of course, it's the Tory party, as we all know, that is riddled with racism through and through. Uh, they introduced the 1905 Aliens Act that blocked Jewish emigration from the East European pogroms. They, uh, it was a Tory MP in the 1930s who founded the Right Club, as it was called, whose uh, aim was to expose the activities of organized Jewry. And of course, we all know the later Tories record of racism, Enoch Powell's descriptions of wide grinning piccaninnies, blood curdling warnings of rivers of blood, Boris Johnson's repetition of the same vile words in his description of piccaninnies with their watermelon smiles. Of course, the outright racist treatment of the Windrush generation that's continuing today. And as for anti-Semitism, it was the Daily Express in the 1930s, which carried the infamous headline, Jews declare war on Germany, you heard that right. And it was the Daily Mail, which, uh, which uh, had a screaming headline in the 1930s too, hurrah for the black shirts. So what about that great fighter against fascism, Winston Churchill? <laughs> Churchill praised Hitler. I've got a few quotes, so I can't resist giving them here. Churchill said, I've always said that if Great Britain were defeated in war, I hoped that we should find a Hitler to lead us back to our rightful position among the nations. Similarly, he told Mussolini, if I had been an Italian, I'm sure I should have been wholeheartedly with you from the start to finish in your triumphant struggle against the bestial appetites and passions of Leninism. In 2016, I was arbitrarily suspended. And eventually I was interviewed by some ignorant moron who is probably not even a party hack, who, um, and I'd like to quote a little bit from the, from the um, transcript of the interview. It wasn't only about, uh, about uh, anti-Semitism and Zionism, it was also um, other issues. But on this question, he, uh, he said, you described Zionism as a virulent form of racism. And my reply was, yes, this is a description many people would endorse. Israel denies a quarter of its population equal civil rights and occupies neighboring territories inhabited by four million people. I put the, uh, uh, the uh, emergence of Zionism in the context of the Holocaust and its aftermath with the despicable treatment of survivors of the concentration camps who had nowhere to live. 
but Zionism has come to represent an oppressive regime, savage wars, and the treatment of Arab Israelis as second-class citizens. I'm appalled that this opinion could be considered anti-Semitic. I'm proud of my own Jewish heritage and culture and traditions, and outraged that one political faction should brand those who disagree with it in this way. I don't have to agree with Zionism, and there is no such requirement in the rules of the Labour Party. He then, he then went on to ask me, he said, you compared Zionism with the rise of black movements like those of Marcus Garvey and talked of the mirage of a Jewish nation in a mythical historical homeland. And I said, yes, that's just a simple historical explanation. At one time, sections of the black population in the USA suffering slavery, lynch laws and Jim Crow had similar hopes that a return to a supposed historical homeland in Africa might be their salvation. I should add that until the pogroms and the Holocaust, Zionism was not much more than an obscure sect. The majority of Russian and European Jews were supporters of the Bund, and their response to the Zionists was, no, this is our home and we're staying. But I have an interesting addendum to this story. A couple of years later, I was browsing through the biography of the famous Nazi hunter, Simon Wiesenthal, and I found a reference to a quotation by someone who had been reading Herzl's book on Zionism. And the quote is this. The, the person who read um, Herzl's book said, the book interested me very much. Up until then, I had no knowledge of such things. Somehow this book touched a chord in me and I took it all in. Does anybody want to guess who the author of those lines was? I'll tell you, Adolf Eichmann. He went on, the Zionists wanted a territory where the Jewish people could finally settle in peace. And that was pretty much what the Nazis wanted. So I think that's the best possible vindication of our position. Now, when it came to Corbyn, as, uh, as Naomi has said, the smear of anti-Semitism was not by any means the first dirty lie that was hurled against him. He was branded as somehow simultaneously both a pacifist and at the same time a terrorist sympathizer, not quite sure how. He was a harmless allotment crank and at the same time a dangerous stylist spy. Again, a little bit um, hard to quite put the picture together. So where then does the anti-Semitism lie come from? I think um, we, have to, we have to see the point of it. First of all, the fact that Israel is, of course, it plays a strategic role in the, uh, in the world order of uh, imperialism. It's a key to uh, control of the oil region. It was set up, as was said by, uh, by a British uh, bureaucrat at the time of the Balfour Declaration, he said, it would be very good to have a loyal little Ulster in the Middle East. Secondly, though, it's also the case that the Israeli state, alarmed at the risk that a major Western power could be led by a committed champion of Palestinian rights, they conjured up this smear, and the British ruling class gratefully seized hold of it. It was a perfect way to soil Corbyn's, uh, Corbyn's reputation from what appeared to be a liberal, humane uh, viewpoint. Now, Goebbels, of course, is known to have recommended the effectiveness of the big lie, that the more monstrously outrageous the lie, the better. So this is a new version of the fake Zinoviev letter in 1923, the absurd accusation that Labour was a puppet of the Communist International, or of Churchill's hysterical outburst in 1945, that Labour was about to establish a Gestapo police state. But the masterstroke is that they gave added currency to the insult by holding back from hurling it themselves in their own name, the name of the Tory party and the establishment, and they which would throw a question mark over its validity, but to put it into the mouths of the Labour leaders themselves. Now, I've got, I saw a quote this morning by Ruth Smith, whoever she is, I've never, uh, but anyway, apparently she's a key figure in the Jewish Labour movement. And she, she's saying that she was, she, uh, what she said in the conference, it was, we have to send a message to the vile racists and bullies who thought that our party could be a home for Jew hate. And then she went on to say that, uh, I feel sick about the idea of being in Brighton, knowing I will be a target for yet more racist abuse. 
what racist abuse can we can she provide can any of them provide one just one uh, uh, hint of racist abuse and as for you know making the party a home for jew hate who is actually uh, suffering more than anybody as as uh, the JBL have pointed out clearer than anybody, but the uh, Jews, um, because um, it's who is actually purging the Labour Party of Jews? It's not the anti-Semites, it's, uh, it's the witch hunters. They are purging Jews from the Labour Party. It's not at all surprising that the witch hunters claim Jews as its first category of victims. As shown, as I say, by the JBL, practically all of whom have been reviled, insulted, manhandled like Leah, uh, and thrown out of the conference. To, uh, just to quote from the JVL, as a population chair, almost five times more Jewish than non-Jewish Labour members have faced complaints of anti-Semitism, which have been investigated. JVL's leaders are more than 200 times more likely to be targeted by the party for investigation than other Labour members, while ordinary JVL members are more than 30 times more likely to face persecution by the Labour right regime. And there's more figures, four times more Jewish than non-Jewish Labour Party members have faced action complaints of anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, when it comes to the JVL committee members, now, I'm oh, sorry, the, a new figure, these Jews are nearly 300 times more likely to be investigated than non-Jewish Labour Party members. Now, why is this? I want to finish on this point. It's not, of course, because the witch hunters are personally anti-Semitic. Maybe some of them are. In fact, I I'm, I'm, wouldn't be at all surprised if some of them are. Others are not. But the main thing is it's, it's a crude and hypocritical, hypocritical camouflage for a political attack on the left. The Jews are collateral damage. Uh, again, I think, as Naomi said, they're especially dangerous to the witch hunters because they undermine the hypocrisy <coughs> of their campaign. However, the assumptions behind the form that the witch hunt has taken are discriminatory against Jews. Let me give a couple of examples. For one thing, it's grossly offensive to dictate the political allegiances of Jews and no one else. Because Jews alone are forbidden to oppose the policies of the Israeli government. They brand anti-Semitic any Jew who opposes Zionism. And I was thinking, trying to think of, a, um, of an analogy would they compel, compel Scots people to support Scottish independence, a, sop, a separate Scottish state? It's flagrant discrimination to impose on Jews alone a single political standpoint. Another example, I'm strongly opposed to the policies of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Does that make me Islamophobic? The IHRA itself includes in its definition of anti-Semitism the allegation that Jews owe prior allegiance to Israel. And yet that's precisely what is demanded of Jews by the witch hunters. It is itself an anti-Semitic trope. It's not that Starmer and company themselves are personally anti-Semitic, but by playing this card, they are stoking up anti-Semitism. And that's the final point I want to make. It's a pathetic trick and it's manifestly not working but it's a highly dangerous game. They're playing with fire. Where anti-Semitism before was pretty well dormant, this campaign risks stirring up prejudice and promoting genuine anti-Semitism because it's giving credibility to the old myth that there really is some kind of worldwide Jewish conspiracy, that Jews somehow have a secret fiendish power to control and manipulate events. The witch hunt has given rise to a dangerous misconception that Starmer and company are paid agents of the Israeli state. Yes, there are Zionists and even Israeli agents promoting the witch hunt. That's proved by documentary evidence. But that's incidental. It exonerates the real arch enemy. Starmer, Blair and Mandelson are first and foremost agents, not of the Israeli state, but of the British state. Not of the Israeli ruling class, but of the British ruling class. In a brilliant inversion of the original ploy, the ruling class are exploiting Jews as a reactionary political weapon. And just as before, the ruling class had always found anti-Semitism a fiendishly useful tool. Now, in a peculiar inversion, a peculiar mirror image, they're trying to deploy popular revulsion against what they dishonestly masquerade as anti-Semitism to discredit the left. Our task is to train our sights on the real enemy, capitalism, and its direct agents at the head of the Labour Party. Thanks, comrades. Thank you, comrades.
that was excellent analysis, um, Roger. Thank you so much. Um, we're moving on now to Duncan um, after a couple of full starts. So Duncan Shipley Dalton is a barrister with a master's in law and human rights. And Duncan is going to talk to us about the failure of the party to uphold natural justice. Thank you, Duncan. Okay, thank you. Is it right? Okay. If you'll allow me, this is uh, a little bit of admin I wanted to do in case the GLU decide to watch. Um, exclusion and limitation of liability. Part of the first part, namely Mr. Duncan Shipley Dalton, is in attendance at this venue and or event as an individual on all remarks are spoken in a personal capacity. The part of the first part shall have no responsibility nor liability with respect to any words spoken or ideas expressed collectively or individually in relation to any organisation, group or individual person at this event. The mere presence of the part of the first part of this location, venue and or event does not indicate support for any organisation, collective group, other individual persons or entity of a political or other character. We've got that recorded, Duncan. Thank you. OK, a bit of fun there in some ways. But <clears throat> I thought a lot about the, the issue of the, the abuse of process has been going on. I, I was looking through my own notes on it, and actually my first motion to my CLP in relation to uh, the disciplinary system was back in 2015. So actually, uh, yeah, October of 2015 was the first time I started complaining, which is after the first purge that happened in relation to the uh, leadership election and then we got a second purge in relation to the uh, chicken coup and I'm uh, thinking a bit about how this relates in, in English history and what it occurred to me was it sort of reminded me of the Star Chamber uh, and in particular the way that Star Chamber now has become you know it's, it's something that's synonymous with unfair practice so it didn't really start out that way it actually started out um, the intent was to try and have a place where nobles could be um, held to account because in the normal courts, the, none of the judges were... <laughs> okay, getting a call for a complaint already, right, okay. <laughs> that the G or you? <laughs> so... But as it as it developed, the obviously the Star Chamber then became has and has become synonymous with um, abuses of process, uh, secretive processes. Um, in particular, you had things like, and this reminded me very much of the way in which the GLU operate, um, the ex officio oath, as it was called, and the Star Chamber, where people had to would swear that they would answer truthfully questions that they were asked. So they're left in a position that either they answer truthfully the questions and incriminate themselves, or they don't answer the questions and then they're held in contempt and deemed to be guilty of the crime anyway. So they, there was no, it was a complete catch-22. And interestingly, when the founding fathers in the United States actually uh, set out the constitution there, that's why the Fifth Amendment allows for protection against self-incrimination. And it's the reason that it exists, is to make sure that that could not happen and you can always take the fifth uh, and so that you don't have to incriminate yourself. So I thought it was sort of interesting because what you see with a lot of the investigations from the party is, is this list of questions where it's you know did you <clears throat> so asking you to self-incriminate by did you publish these things do you agree with these comments will you do this in the future you know do you think this is discriminatory and will you act in a discriminatory fashion in the future and so it's this absurd bunch of essentially when did you stop beating your wife questions um, and they're not in any way a genuine inquiry they're just simply designed well partly to get people to incriminate themselves because unfortunately some people don't realize and they do um and also you know, as i say they're catch 22s because if you don't answer the questions then they hold that against you so yeah, the investigatory process has been, um, I think, yeah. and then you have the situation where the panel, the disputes panel now that's, that hears the cases after we had the setup of the NEC fast track process um, is actually held, I mean, essentially it's held in secret with three or possibly five members of the NEC, um, a lawyer advising them, uh, but nobody from the accused party can attend. So you can't even send a lawyer to represent you at that hearing. It's all done on paper and they process them at a speed of knots. I've heard, I think 50 in one day at one time. So <laughs> uh, how they can possibly uh, assess a case properly in, in the space of 10 or 15 minutes per case. Um, it literally is just a rubber stamp uh, of, 
you know, guilt, essentially, things. Now, that I have argued with some of the NEC over it, and they say, well, well we don't find guilt in every case. Said, well, OK, <laughs> really? Because <laughs> you did a pretty good job of finding guilt in almost every case as well. But, and one of the things I've noticed in the new rules that have come through, the new disciplinary rules, essentially, this is doubled up on, because now what you have is a situation where supposedly it's independent, but we have the independent review panel and the independent uh, appeals board. Uh, but the NEC panel is the one that makes all the decisions on the disciplinary case. And they have all of the substantive discretionary power to make the decisions. So they can decide on, if there's an allegation, okay, this is anti-Semitic, the NEC decide on whether it's anti-Semitic. Then the independent review panel look at it, but they only look at it on the procedural issues. They don't look at the substantive issues. So they can't change the substantive discretionary decision that's been made. And then the appeal board only hears an appeal case if there are reasonable grounds. And what struck me is that the reasonable grounds of this are also procedural. And as you've just had the lawyer from the independent review panel say that the procedures were all followed and the NEC have approved that, then how are you ever going to get to reasonable grounds for an appeal on procedural grounds because they've already said the procedural grounds were followed? Yeah, it, it, again, a catch-22. I suspect you'll end up with virtually no appeals, even though the appeal board, in theory, has uh, substantive power to actually overturn you know, a substantive definition. It is never going to hear any appeals so the the odds of actually getting there i think are very slim so again and what's so fascinating about that is it this this is all done in secret and the star chamber actually did allow people to see it. i know it's, people think of it as actually being secretive it was it's to some extent but actually its hearings were held in public and uh, members of the public could go so the gentry thinks you did used to actually go to that and watch it. So there you are. So Labour's managed to create a disciplinary panel that's worse than the Star Chamber. <laughs> Star Merch. <laughs> the Star Merch. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that one. <laughs> so uh, uh, one of the great dilemmas for me has been that during the period when Jeremy was in the leadership. I, I was absolutely supportive of Jeremy. Voted for him both times. You know, I thought he was fab. Applied for actually quite a lot of jobs in his office, but never got picked. But anyway, um, so I was very. But at the same time as this was going on, they, you know, I do feel that there was a lot of mistakes made, and a lot of the things, a lot of the things that have turned into even worse situations now were created during that period as well. So you know, the NEC panel that was created. I mean, that was Jenny Formby that put that forward. You know, the changes to 218 that effectively removed the right to uh, free, free speech. I mean, if you look at the 218 version in 2016, you had the NCC was the only body that could make determinations and the NCC could not take into account expressions of belief and opinion. And it was an absolute rule. Then 2017, that was changed by, uh, you know, under Jeremy's leadership, unfortunately, and we ended up with various caveats being added to that, which they're extending again, by the way, so that you've now got the codes of conduct being added to that as well. So essentially now freedom of speech is so long as you don't do anything that's contrary to the codes of conduct and the codes of conduct are written by the NEC, not by conference. So these rule disciplinary rules can be extended in any way that the uh, NEC wishes and it doesn't go to conference they're not they're being backdoored into the rules essentially and what they've done is is completely uh, wrecked the relationship between conference the NEC uh, and, and the rest of the party uh, in having a balance between those bodies so that and that essentially the rules were supposed to be you know the core of uh, operation of the party and to give members rights but it's been completely run over um with most of it being centralized into the nec instead so what you're getting is essentially a little oligarchy um that are you know com maintaining complete control and that includes then the disciplinary process which they've managed to move a lot of it into their own power so that they'll be to make the decisions on disciplinary it's not really subject to the rules in the same way anymore um and that's that's obviously is a massive danger because it's the operation of it then is entirely political it's can be used as a political weapon it's not a disciplinary process designed to uphold members rights to uphold things like freedom of speech freedom of association i mean you know as far as i'm concerned 
if I want to come and speak at a meeting like this, it's, it's my right under Article 9, Article 10, and Article 11 of the European Convention on Human Rights, which it actually says in the Labour Party rules the party's supposed to stand for. So, sorry, get, sometimes that gets me frustrated. <laughs> Just, but, it, but it is something when supposedly the progressive and anti-racist party is the one that is trampling all over the rights and, and trampling on human rights. I mean, because you've... Uh, and it, it, my concern with this has always been that if the party in itself and its own operations behaves like this, then what is to stop it behaving like this when it, if it is ever in power? You know, and that's that's the problem is that when you have um, Blairites who operated in a similar way, not quite as, as bad, but in a similar way, then what you end up with is Jack Straw illegally uh, renditioning people to Libya to be tortured. <laughs> so. Okay, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so now na the natural justice point, and uh, it's there's been obviously some challenges in, in the courts. I mean, it's very it's a difficult one because there are there is basically the, the courts don't tend to interfere with private organizations and how they manage themselves. They prefer to stay out of it largely, but um, they will in, and there is a history in case law of the courts um, intervening in relation to particular aspects of natural justice. And the two big ones being the right to be heard and the right to an unbiased tribunal. Uh, and then you get other rights that stem off those. But basically, they're the two big areas. Uh, and that's where the, the courts have actually sort of they will interfere. So, for instance, the right to be heard. Now, I mean, my view is that the prescription that's gone on and that actually I've always felt that that particular rule in uh, two is probably not in accordance with <coughs> natural justice because it doesn't allow for a proper um, right for the accused party to actually be heard so you know you don't essentially get a right to reply if you're accused of and then put through the auto expulsion is just a staffer who tells you you're expelled and it, even more ridiculously that they've been telling people they have to prove that they're not a member of organization or not supportive of an organization, uh, which so they've turned the balance of uh, obviously the burden of proof around as well, which is, a, you know, the balance proof, which is absurd because if you accuse of something, it's for them to prove it, not for you to defend it. I mean, on top of which, you know, did they not read books up there in the GOU or something? They've never heard of trying to prove a negative. <laughs> Next thing you'll be telling you to prove there's a God. <laughs> Or prove there isn't you know, whichever <laughs> either way you're stuck <laughs> so i would like to see that one challenged actually um, um, and i had hoped it would be challenged but um it because it, it does look to me like that and the nec panel would have some there would be some scope for challenging on the basis that you've got no a genuine right to be heard and the courts in the past when they've looked at the right to be heard they do judge it based on um, the extent of the allegation, the seriousness of the allegations as well. I mean, if you're accused of a minor thing in a club and you get expelled, well, you might, you know, it might just be dealt with by way of a paper hearing. But when you're being accused of something like uh, racism, you know, serious racism, that could knock on to your character and reputation in your community, could have an effect on your employment position, oh, yeah. uh, then obviously that's a much more serious thing and it's not good enough that the only response you get is that you had an opportunity to answer the set of when did you start beating, you know, stop beating your wife questions that they sent you and gave you seven days to reply and usually don't send it until a little bit later as well and then give you, so you've got even less time to reply. Um, not to mention the number of cases where they've completely ignored the fact that, that people have disabilities or, uh, uh, you know, would be protected characteristic under the Equality Act um, and should be given reasonable accommodation, but they're not being given it. They're being told to somebody with, for instance, a mental illness, uh, who's been given seven days to respond. And obviously that places an excessive burden on somebody who's not in a position to respond in that way. Or you may have people who, you know, not as literate. Um, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. Well, it, it... Uh, what, what what I'm curious about is there must be there must be employing lawyers to uh -huh. send out these letters and do this stuff and do they, do they not wonder? Um, and and also I did write back when I have my notice of investigation. I did write back and say, please can you tell me how I can prove I am not a member or supporter? And I've had no response. They 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 clearly can't 
answer the question. So it will go on and on, I suspect. Um, so finally, before questions, I, I just wanted to provide some insights. Um, Neil asked me to provide some insights into the impact of the purges on Labour Party finances. So stepping outside of my chair. Um, and I've got some slides which I hope will appear on the screen. Um, maybe not. The slides about the finance. I hope so. Well, if um, I'll, I'll leave you to look for those. I'll, I'll talk through. So um, the the income to the Labour Party in 2019 was at its highest level ever, dropped back in 2020 at, to its lowest level to, since 2014. But this was nothing to do with membership income. This is due partly to COVID and the fact that there was no conference and the party generally generates a lot of income from its conference. Um, however, as I asked somebody to point out at the conference, the, the, the Treasurer does make some slightly inaccurate references to reductions in short money um, impacting on income in 2020 by one and a half million, when in fact it was only 1.0.4 million. Um, if you want to the detail of that, look at my Twitter on at vote Esther, um, the Twitter handles in the leaflet. But the, the key component of income to the party, as I expect many of you know already, is membership income. And membership income has increased dramatically since 2014. And in 2020, it was at its highest level ever, level ever at 19.3 million. It's never been that high before. And this is despite, during 2020, Although it reached 19.3 million, during 2020, many members then started to leave. So if those members had not started to leave, then that 19.3 million would have been even higher. So 2020 was a record year for membership income. And despite that, the party still made a loss of a million pounds. And as we know, and as we've heard today, there were many factors driving that exit of members from the party including disillusionment, administrative suspensions, suspensions, expulsions, auto-exclusions, and so forth. But bearing in mind that there's absolutely no doubt that the party's financial recovery was driven by membership income, the opposite is almost definitely going to be the case, which I'll come on to. Um, because we know that membership has now dropped by, some people say 120,000, some people say, up to 200,000. My estimate of the income of that drop compared to 19.3 million, I think there's probably a drop of income that can be anticipated of around six million pounds in 2021. And, and probably it will get worse. Um, and if the party had a loss of a million in 2020, and it's going to lose six million pounds in 2021, that is going to drive the party finances into great trouble. And we've already heard this year that the party is implementing cuts in staffing. Now, there's something odd going on here as well, because in 2020, the, the running costs of the party did reduce by um, around 2.3 million for actual labour costs for staff employed. So there's a reduction in employment costs of around 2.3 million. But there was a mysterious heading that appeared in the running costs of the accounts. It was called admin costs and somebody did ask a question at conference as to what these admin costs were and there was no answer um, and at the same time I think there was something in one of the newspapers today about the Labour Party having to spend about two million pounds a year on legal costs so I suspect those admin costs might relate to legal costs so you've got two things going on here you've got the drop in membership income I estimate around six million pounds. You've got this mysterious increase in admin costs. And we've already got that validated in the press today saying there's two million pounds being spent a year on legal costs. And so this is driving the party um, into um, a financial crisis. And finally, 
as well as losing the membership income, as well as racking up the legal costs, the party is also quite possibly going to lose some of its union donors. And we've all already seen um, commentary from Sharon Gray and Graham of, of Unite. Now, Unite donated £5 million in 2020. And the Bakers Union and CWU are also making noises about withdrawing support to the party. Um, together, those two, those three unions, we could lose another £6 million to the party. And if you look at the total donations, this is outside of an election year, the total donations in, in 2020 um, of 11 million um, came from unions. And only 1 million came from individuals. So if the party is going to replace its donation income from unions with donations from individuals, it's got a massive way to go if it's going to replace 5 million or 11 million pounds worth of union donations, where it's only getting 1 million pounds worth of personal donations at the moment. Now, the biggest donor in 2020 was Wahid Ali, who gave 125k. So he's going to have to dig deep if he wants to keep the Labour Party so going. So from a million pound deficit in 2020, now I've been racking up costs, haven't I? I said they could lose £6 million worth um, of membership income. They could lose £5 million worth of union income. The other thing that we know is at the end of 2020, the party had £10 million left in its reserves. And you could see that could very, very quickly disappear. Now, the party should have a reserves policy, which says it needs to keep three months of running costs in its reserves, um, just in case it falls upon hard times. So at the end of 2020, the party was absolutely down to that minimum reserve level because three months of running costs is around 10 million, 10 million pounds. So the party literally has nowhere to go. It's killing the goose that laid the golden egg. Um, it's losing its members. So that's what I have to say about the impact of all of this on the, on the party finances. A little bit of time now for questions. So we've got actually half an hour um, for questions. And are you still there, Neil? Yes, I'm here. Yep. Can and you still, still there, me? Brian? Good. I am. Yeah. Okay. So um, questions from the floor. Then um, we've got two hands at the back there. Um, somebody in the blue cap. You can go first, and then person next to you. Can you give us your name, please? And can we have somebody who will run around with the Microphone. I'm Faraz Khan from Cambridge. Um, I'm on steering committee of Lean. Uh, the gentleman, I've forgotten your name, the lawyer, was saying uh, something about natural justice. I mean, I don't think you fully completed your argument because you didn't define natural justice because. I have, I'm at the end of the day, we have to think of a way forward. That's, I think that's the point of Rialto, uh, as far as I see it. And uh, in any uh, professional body, even your own professional body, if you come to a disciplinary committee, they have carte blanche virtually to do what they like, don't they? They, they, they want to discipline you. It's virtually a quango. The, in any professional organisation, they can do what they like. It's, I don't think natural justice exists. It's just a figment. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you think about it philosophically, then natural justice sort of stems from, if you think Aquinas was making the point that uh, law man's law isn't just law unless it's also in line with god's law so in that way natural justice historically does come from a sense of it, it being you know um from god essentially and from natural justice that way but in more modern times obviously that's not so much the the argument and it's 
become part of procedural justice. So it's not so much that it's talking about natural justice in terms of the outcome, but what it's talking about is that in a any kind of um, discretionary body that's making a decision like that, or any decision-making body, I mean, whether it be a public authority or uh, a private body, you're entitled to a process justice and that the process has a fairness to it now that doesn't necessarily mean that the outcome's going to be fair because yes there can be problems with how the the body makes this decision but what you at least have a right to is some form of process justice um, and this it would be my criticism of labor has been that the system that's been set up doesn't have process justice at all um, and therefore you're not going to get outcome justice you've no chance of outcome justice because uh, you have absolutely no process justice you have no right to actually properly put your argument to the body you have no right to a body that's um, unbiased i mean we have a situation with a new disciplinary panel that's going to be introduced and potentially you could be accused of anti-semitism and you'd have a three-person panel and one of them will be luke gatekirst and one of them will be margaret hodge <clears throat> now if you think you're going to get a fair hearing from that tribunal you know you're potting basically no. is, is that an answer of sorts <laughs> um naomi's just done um, pointed out that she needs to leave in um 10 minutes maximum so does anyone have any specific questions for Naomi, first of all? I would have to say more anyway. <laughs> all right, well, let's have um, general questions. Um, oh. So, yeah, um, it, in the blue. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my question is for Duncan. Uh, I'm Damien from Mid Dorset uh, North Pool Labour Party, um, just. Um, I, I made a complaint two and a half years ago about somebody who appeared on that flow chart. It's a Labour Party member who's had complaint after complaint against him, who's obviously working with the likes of Luke Akehurst and the party to, to deliver names to HQ. I managed to clear myself, but the party failed to redact this person's name when I did my subject access request. So Naomi, you know about my case. Duncan, why can we not build a case against the Labour Party for all those people that can prove through their subject access requests that they were obviously operating an unfair system? Because the fact that that person on the screen is still a member, my evidence to the EHRC inquiry and to the Ford report is got tweets of him actively campaigning against the party. He promoted the ABC anyone but Corbyn campaign. He's called for the party to be wrecked. He sat at Lawyers for Israel meeting with his lawyer, and we all know who that is, and they were joking about the fact that their plan has always been to bankrupt the Labour Party, and his lawyer had um, a key role in, in getting the news of the world shut down. So you can prove that it's a very biased system when people like him can campaign against the party you can show the party all of his tweets and he remains a member and yet he admits to working for for McNichol's secret team <laughs> yeah oh, right, okay. uh, hmm. yes it's, it's i mean i'd like to be able to say you know it's an easy thing build a case get and go off some of people but the problem you're dealing with a situation where the processes involved aren't being operated fairly so um i mean that's a big part of your problem they're shielded by a lot of people they obviously have money that's coming in from other places as well to support them um and at the end of the day if the disciplinary process is being run in a way that's biased and it's operated by those who are biased then um you know no matter how many complaints you make against somebody it's not going to be followed up uh, and that's clearly been the situation that you, you know lots i've come across lots of people who've made complaints about various things um and it never goes anywhere the complaint that i have one we have one in southampton we made several years back when a right-wing member of the well was one of the labor first local labor first people and he punched one of our left-wing delegates in the face at the agm and we, we had witnesses we had cameras in the place as well and we went to the police the police didn't want to do anything because the party wouldn't to blame and the local right-wing leadership of the southampton association didn't want to do anything because they said well there's no evidence and say, right apart from all the witnesses and the film that we've got of it you know and his bruises you know but so that that's the, what you're dealing with is a lot of people in those positions who do operate in an entirely biased way and 
absolutely uh, ignore the rules, no matter what, they just ignore it. Yeah, I mean, it, yes, yeah, well, it, because it's an unincorporated association, everybody has a contract with everybody else is how it works. There is no contract between Labour and members because there is no Labour. It doesn't exist as a, a legal personality, so it can't form contracts. Um, the contracts are formed member to member is how it works. It's one big contract between all, all members. Um, so it means then if you, yes, if you want to take a claim that you've got to go through contract law to do it. And the, the issue is how can you demonstrate under the contract terms that there might be that bias. And so it's what you can build on, you know, as a legal justification, you might better show the court evidence that you might think well, that's terrible, but what's the, you know, the legal leg that you stand it on. And that's, that's sometimes the difficulty is finding those, those issues that you, legal issues that you can stand something like that on. Uh, sorry, it's not a great answer again. <laughs> I'll leave, <laughs> I'll get my coat. <laughs> Yeah. That's right. well, well, what I was going to say is, I'm really sorry, I've got to go myself. I was going to say that there are people like Richard Cooper there, who's our JVL's web editor, in the room. So Richard could pick up things that people might want to ask me about. I just wanted to say something before I go about the fact that what we are talking about here is not known even within the Labour Party, I mean, we've been going around with our JVL stickers saying, try, pointing out what's been going on with Jewish, uh, Leia's case in particular, but Jewish people being disciplined. And people in the Labour Party have no idea. People outside the Labour Party have absolutely no clue as to what is happening in our party. And, and I want to, to give Brian an opportunity to, to come back in here because we missed a lot of what he said and he, he's a brilliant analyst of, of what the media is, uh, is like in general and, and to, you know, can help us understand what's going on here. We can't get our story out there. You know, we bring legal cases. Richard can talk a bit more about the legal case. Nobody gets to hear about them. I mean, there are really major injustices going on in the set currently the second most significant political party in the United Kingdom. And nobody knows about it because the media only wants to report bad news for the left. I think I think it's a really difficult. So the Ipso case that um, Brian is helping Joe Bird and others pursue is very significant. But what it's showing is how bloody weak we are because the coverage so far has been, well, Byline Times that Brian regularly writes for, I've given um, Esther a link that she might be able to put around of Brian's latest article on it. Um, I think we've got a little bit of coverage in the Indy and maybe even the Guardian, but very, very muted. So I think we ought to be thinking about how, you know, how do we break through that barrier of just understanding outside of our own closed circle? I'm going to sneak off now. Is that all right? But Richard's definitely, I think, I think Marion's still, yeah, there are people from JVL who've got good knowledge about all this stuff. <laughs> It may be, thank you, Naomi. It may be that Brian um, has some response to that as well. Do, do you want to pick that up, Brian, before we move on to another question? I'm happy to, but it's not a very cheerful response. Um, I mean, I, you know, um, campaigning for what I campaign for, I have uh, long ago got used to being an absolute pariah in the mainstream media. And it's not just um, the Telegraph, the um, Times, the Mail, the Express, uh, and the Sun. Um, it is uh, it is the rest of them. I mean, uh, you know, the Guardian. Um, I think would rather die than you know take an article from me. And you know, I have a twenty years experience of writing opinion pieces. Um, they, 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 the BBC broadcasters used to frequently to consult. You know, to get a hacked off representative on to talk about press issues. Almost never now. Almost never. I mean, it, it is a, it is a, a very um, narrow channel. I mean, it, we're fortunate in a way that, um, that Byline Times exists. We're fortunate that, um, that there is Twitter, you know, that there are, um, and that there are some people with powerful followings on Twitter who are prepared to chase these issues. There is a, you know, there are um, uh, left wing um, or um, a kind of niche interest 
um, uh, publications and organizations which are prepared to promote these things. But it is, I mean, it's, it's David and Goliath. I don't, um, I don't underestimate it. Okay, yeah, thank, thank, thank you, Brian. Long way to go. Um, there's a hand Very up long. there. Um, thank you. Can you. Introduce yourself, please. Yeah, my name is John Booth, um, a former Guardian journalist and a former chief press officer of the Labour Party back in the 1980s. And just to add a little to what Roger said and also to the timeline, going back a, a long way to the time when the Labour Party was doing this kind of thing before. And during the Cold War, when Hugh Gateskill was leader, he was assisted in his work in seeking to expel Anarim Bevan at that time. This is all included in the diaries of Hugh Gateskill, edited by Philip Williams. He had the services of Sam Watson, who was his principal NEC ally, who was the leader of the Durham Miners. And he also had the assistance of Joseph Godson, who was the labor attache at the American embassy. And so there was a serious external influence being brought to bear to bring Labour Party members into line. And I think that's a useful parallel to have in mind as we think about the dynamics of what's going on. The curious um, um, irony in all of this is the son of Joseph Gotson, the Labour attaché, is Dean Gotson, who is the head of policy exchange which is a right-wing propagandist thing, according to some people, is Boris Johnson's favorite think tank. And so there's a family continuity of external involvement in domestic British politics. And that's something a lot of people in the party don't want to face up to because they have this romantic delusion that the legal system and the party somehow is administered by a referee who can issue red cards or an umpire who can raise the finger and say, you're out. We don't have that. People who win scoop the lot. That's the harsh reality that we have to face. And that's why the people who undermined the Labour Party during the Corbyn years have such a vast responsibility because they did what they did knowing knowing it would guarantee a conservative win for a very long time. And that's part of the reality we have to gear up to. Those of us who are at the older end of the spectrum can't do much more about it, except perhaps point up a little bit of the history the way that Roger did. But we can encourage young people to engage with that dimension and say this is not just to do with the weakness of people. This is a very well-organized campaign to undermine the confidence of Labour Party members and lead them to believe they are indecently behaving and that they are prejudicial towards people. And it's overwhelmingly untrue. It's been a gigantic contract which has been brought about in order to support all kinds of other interests which are wider than the immediate interests of the Labour Party. That's what we need to engage with. It's that level of reality, which I find in the Labour Party, not many people are willing to engage with. Thank you, John, really good points. Engage and educate, thank you. Um, yeah, second row. Thank you. Yeah, hi, I'm Ian, Ian Donovan from uh, Consist Democrats and a member of a uh, Resist, actually. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of points. I mean, I think I think people made a point about Ruth Smith and how uh, I think Roger made a point about Ruth Smith and her her speech at the conference and seemed to make make out it was of no consequence. The problem or imply that, but actually, it's not of no consequence. She had a she got a standing ovation, you know, according to what I've read in the media today, you know, um, and she basically attacked the left in a very virulent manner uh, and carried it, basically. I mean, I think this, this is something we really have to get our head around. I think we've got a big problem on the left, and it's, it's basically the, qu the question of why is the left throwing each other under the bus in the face of these witch hunts? Why did Jeremy Corbyn not defend people like Ken Livingstone and Jackie Walker and, 
uh, Tony Greenstein and, and, and Chris Williamson and everybody else? Why do, why do people like John McDonnell, uh, why do people like Owen Jones, why, do, why does this, this keep happening, that the left is, is prepared, doesn't understand the basic, basic uh, uh, maximum of solidarity, that an injury to one is an injury to all, and stand together. And I think there's a serious problem here. I mean, people have been talking, uh, you know, reminiscing to some extent about terrible things that happened to the Jewish people in the past. Uh, and I think that's all, all legitimate. But I think it's missing something that's more up to date, which is that things have changed. And the, what, the pe people, the people who were once oppressed are now oppressing other people, you know. And the implications of that, I don't think, have been fully digested by the left. Like Israel is not some pathetic little client state of the, of the West. It's actually quite a, 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 it's a serious imperialist force. And, it, and it, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not equivalent to, say, what Marcus Garvey wanted to create in Africa, which was, uh, uh, I mean, it was created in a sense. It's, it's you know, semi-colonial impoverished countries like uh, Liberia or Sierra Leone, which are a disaster, which was the equivalent, that was the outcome of that. Zionism is seriously a, a, a dangerous imperialist force in the world. And... Uh, um, it, it speaks with a powerful voice. I think Ruth Smith speaks with a powerful voice. You know, she's, she's a representative of, of, of a whole bigger layer of, of the Labour Party and interpenetrates with the Tories and with other, 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 other bodies, right? That, that has, the, it has a great deal of support in the ruling class. It probably has decisive support in the ruling class. There are, there's, a, there's a long argument about why that is. I'm not going to go into it here because I haven't got time, you know. Uh, but, but I think we need to really, uh, you know, I, I'm just, I'm not going to speak this longer, but I just think we need to get our head round and to ask the question ideologically and politically, why is the left incapable, or has, has proved incapable of uniting in defence of itself against this Zionist witch hunt? Uh, and, and try to debate that. Uh, yeah. that's, that's all I'm going to say for now. No, good points, Ian. Thank you. Um, appeasement never works. Um, any more contributions from the floor, please? Um, yes, gentlemen. There. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of words Can about you my own. Introduce yourself, please. Sorry, I know Stan, we know you are. <laughs> Stan Keeble, um, Labour Party Marxist. You've probably seen our broadsheet, but I wanted to. I didn't want to talk about that. I want to talk about my personal case just briefly, because um, with the statistics, I think Neil said the expulsion started in 2018, which is, uh, and that was mentioned by a previous meeting, but of course, Moshe Makova was expelled on October the 2nd, 2017. I think he means the case numbers, Stan. Well, he might do, but yeah. he, he said expelled. He said expelled, that's what I heard. But I'm, I'm making it clear. Somebody said it the other day uh, as well in a different meeting. But um, but no, I mean, it's October the 2nd, 2017. I remember the conference well, because I was giving away Moshe Makova's um, article, uh, Anti-Zionism Does Not Equal Anti-Semitism. That was the title. And that was what they used to accuse him of being anti-Semitic. Um, and I was giving it away, so I was accused of being anti-Semitic, but they unfortunately couldn't try me they couldn't go through my case because they expelled me for being a Marxist. <laughs> um, Moshe got reinstated at the end of October 2017 because of the international outcry. I didn't, so I'm still out. I'm waiting. It's going to be five years, won't it? It's going to be five years. But six months later, I went to the Enough is Enough demonstration and supported the Jewish Voice for Labour on that. and talked. I went amongst the Zionist crowd and talked to them all and leafleted them. Had some really interesting discussions that day. But uh, the next morning, I was, uh, <clears throat> I was called to the, uh, well, the next morning, 10 o'clock, the leader of the council, Labour Council, in uh, Hammersmith and Fulham, emailed the chief executive, uh, Stan Keeble, employee of the council, uh, making anti-Semitic comments. I think this is, um, he said, I think this is uh, gross misconduct. Uh, investigate and report back to me, you know, urgently. Like that, that was the email. And um, that was 10 o'clock. At two o'clock, I got the letter. And I was, I was I had to meet my director, and he had, with a human resources person, handed me a letter that didn't say anti-Semitic. So these poor officials spent the next 
well, you know, year or so trying to investigate and trying to work out how they could accuse me of something being offensive and so on, when it was lawful speech and it wasn't anti-Semitic, right? They should have decided that morning to withdraw the case, shouldn't they? But they went ahead. And uh, then I got a reinstatement order from the Employment Tribunal in January 2020. Well, that's a long time ago, isn't it now? Um, the council appealed, right? Council appealed, okay, the officials are not under political pressure, they said, and they got, the judge accepted that, you know, they're doing it of their own free will. Um, <laughs> and then, um, and, and then the, uh, a, a year later, we had the um, Employment Appeals Tribunal, that's the next level in the courts, you know, and we had a hearing in January 2021. That's six months ago, isn't it? And I'm waiting for the decision. So watch out for it. It must be soon, surely, mustn't it? Thank you, Stan. Um, and you echo a point that Duncan made about um, how these accusations can, in fact, affect your employment. It's very serious. So thank you. Um, yes, on the end here. Do you mind if I just uh, reply to, to that point? Uh, yes, yeah, sure, Neil. Because yeah, my, we'll my name is mentioned. So, um, Neil, we'll take this next question first and then, then you can respond, possibly to both. Sure, OK. Um, hi, I'm Mel Melvin, and um, uh, Brighton's also been the scene of a massive load of targeting in the witch hunt. Um, I was women's officer for um, Kemp Town in 2017. Immediately, I got targeted on social media, threatened, trawled, my family threatened. I was, um, information was leaked to the Jewish Chronicle, they did a hit piece on me with some false information. And this, so this is six years ago now. And I sort of closed everything down. It was very frightening. Um, and it kind of went quiet for a bit and I blocked everybody and was so shocked because I'd gone into politics very innocently, infused by Jeremy Corbyn. I'm just a yoga teacher <laughs> and I run a, a retreat business. So I run a very successful retreat business. Um, and then recently, just last week, um, I just want to, I just want people to realize the cost of the appeasement of the witch hunt on the individuals because my, they broke into my Facebook account, which is where I run my business, um, by a photo they'd found on one of these online posters of witch hunts of individuals, and they had trawled my account, got got co control of my account, and posted a, a really defamatory review about my retreats, having not been on my retreats, saying I was an extremist. They put they attached the thing from the Jewish Chronicle, and got all my business shut down. So and and so there's defamation all over them, and I've got a family to bring up. So this is this is this is still going on. There are gangs of people online trawling people for one tweet about Israel, and so I just wanted to put that through and just to show what the effect of this is. Solidarity, Mel. So thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so, so, Neil, do, do you want to respond um, now, please? Oh, oh, just to the previous. I, I mean, that the, the last case is utterly appalling. I'm so sorry to hear that. It is one of many thousands of people. Um, just illustrates the monstrosity of this awful purge that's going on. Um, I just can I just respond to Kit Stan because he mentioned my name. Um, yes, Stan, Stan is correct. I, I hadn't included Moshe. I apologise for that. Um, um, uh, the, but it, in terms of the, the, the timeline I was sketching out, actually, it, it occurred about the same period, you know, the, the, the 27, 2018, because, I mean, Tony and Jackie were, were all, I think, early, early 2018. So it's probably within six months of Moshe, I'd, I'd say. So, I mean, I was trying to sketch the, an eight year timeline in five minutes so it's very hard to get all those details but um i think the general principle of what i was saying is correct thanks thank you and we've got time for one more question or contribution thank you at the back there towards the back there thank you okay thank you uh, my name's wendy patterson uh i'm newark uh, still a Labour Party member, but um, I'm on strike. I, I just, I've got a question about um, the legal route and is it hopeless? Uh, so it's just a quick one. I don't know whether Richard could help us with the case of the Labour activists for justice. My understanding of the outcome of that uh, was that um, the judge said um, 
um, the Labour Party's a, a political party, it can do um, whatever it's like. So is the legal route hopeless? Because for a while, it was what I was looking to, to think surely we can get the justice somewhere. So I wonder whether Richard, would you like to? Sorry, Richard Cooper from Jewish Voice for Labour. Just on that, the, the Labour activists for, for justice case uh, was lost. The judge basically, uh, you know, I, I mean, lost at great expense, let me also add. We had to find large amounts of money to pay for that cost and to pay Labour Party costs. And the decision in that case was, as, as Wendy has just said, that in effect, the Labour Party can do what it wants. Uh, it, it is an org organization. Uh, it, basically, the implications seem to be, if you don't like this party, go and join another one. Like if you don't like the tennis club down the road, go and play somewhere else. Given the political system, given the framework within which we're operating, parties, the decisions of parties clearly have major implications for individual members, as we've just heard in all kinds of cases. And yet the judge in this case really washed his hands of the consequences there. I mean, one of the arguments in that case was about the EHRC. Labour had just accepted the EHRC's report, which had said that the disciplinary procedures that Labour had used up to that point were not fit for purpose. Although Labour had accepted that, our case to the judge that therefore these cases should not be proceeded with because they had been decided under the old code of conduct was ruled out of order. He, he said, in effect, yes, they have accepted that, but that doesn't mean that the decisions made under the old code weren't all right. In other words, you know, to put it in a broader political context, the law is not an independent uh, uh, body it doesn't operate in isolation from enormous social pressures and the judge in that case clearly took the side uh, how to put it, he took the side of the establishment he said we are not going to give these people the time of day because it would disrupt it would disrupt the system of control which currently operates which is good enough in other words, justice was not a criterion used in his decision about this, but to say the courts do not interfere in the behavior, although as, uh, Duncan can elaborate this. Uh, but in, in effect, I, I think that's what you, you wrote at the time, Duncan, as well, that, you know, that basically the legal route is virtually close to us. I wouldn't want to rule it out in principle. It is enormously costly. It is enormously uh, arbitrary in its outcomes. We had lawyers who were very, very convinced that our case uh, was a good case. Uh, like all lawyers, they obviously didn't say we were gonna win, but they said they thought it was worth the risk. Uh, and we thought it was worth the risk. We were supporting, it wasn't JVL's case, it was supporting, I think in the end, eight individual members of the Labour Party who took cases about the mistreatment they had received at the hands of the Labour Party. We lost. I would not advocate taking another case against the Labour Party. It is emotionally traumatic. Well, in Stan's case, he's been waiting five years, and this is just uh, employment tribunals and how it comes from there. It wears you down, and I think it is designed to wear you down. In the end, it is only collective action that can do anything about it. And we're on the losing end of that process at the moment. We have to just bear in mind, we have suffered terrible setbacks and we are in a process of having to rebuild. And it's important we get the principles right, solidarity right, cooperation with whoever we can cooperate with. I would say I don't judge John McDonnell harshly, although I wish on many occasions he'd done other things. Nonetheless, I think John is on our side, Jeremy is on our side. We've got to build as broad a movement as possible. We have got to try and win the arguments. Uh, and, uh, and that's all. The legal route is not one I would now advocate. Th thank you, um, Richard. And thank you, Wendy. Um, we're going to have to close now, but perhaps give Duncan a final opportunity to respond to that. Yeah, I... I... Sorry. Oh. Came out of the LAPD. Because the Labour Party 
uh, in the uh, one of the things that's gagged us all, I, I, I've been suspended and reinstated as well. My name's Marion Roberts. Uh, is the uh, clause that's always put in those letters about don't tell anyone apart from the Samaritans or your doctor, <laughs> not even a close relative. And people have been really, really frightened by that. And uh, the Labour Party in the in the LA for J case said it was merely a request. And it wasn't a requirement, and that was accepted by the judge. But the catch-22 is that by exposing your case and, you know, going and on squawk box and all those other things, you are then subject to Rule 2.1.8, which might call the party into disrepute. But <laughs> so they get, if you don't get you one way, they'll get you another. But <laughs> I think it is something that is a small game for for activists thank you Duncan yeah just quick quickly then to respond to that I don't think the avenues closed but I do think that if you're going to litigate you've got to be very tactical about it um I think scattergun litigation and particularly going high court is very risky uh, because of the sums of money involved um I did read the judgment justice butcher's judgment and i'm not sure i totally agree with that assessment of it but i know i think i wrote a response didn't i to, say, uh, to the uh, and wrote in reference to give you some idea whether i thought there were avenues for appeal um but uh, my view the appeal was too would be too expensive exactly the risk reward ratio for an appeal wouldn't have been worth it um even though there were aspects of the judgment which i did think where he contradicted himself to an extent um but I'll, to be brutally frank, I didn't think the three legs of it were particularly strong. So I wasn't absolutely surprised by the outcome. Um, but, you know, I would differ with the, obviously the legal advice you got. Um, but then, that, you know, that's what you're paid to do as a lawyer is differ with other lawyers. So, you know, <laughs> part of the game. Um, yeah, so, so I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, at, at the moment, one of the things I think is a, a possible avenue is that under the Equality Act, um, uh, it covers section 10 covers religious belief, uh, but also philosophical political belief as well, um, which is actually a protected characteristic. So in my view, for instance, being a Marxist in the Labour Party is a protected characteristic and therefore under section 101 of the Equality Act, you cannot be excluded from an association on the basis of a protected characteristic. So it would be my view that under the Equality Act, you do have a potential claim there uh, in relation to where you've been excluded under the auto exclusion rule for on the grounds of being a Marxist, let's say, or other that would come under uh, that kind of political philosophical belief. And the key is to look at the Granger case back in 2012, which sets down basically five criteria. If you meet those criteria, you have a good argument that it is a philosophical political belief and protected under the Equality Act. Um, and that was recently reinforced by the Industrial Appeal Tribunal and Justice Chowdhury as well. So definitely worth <laughs> looking at. Um, I think it's got legs as a case. I wouldn't take it to the High Court. Take it through your, you know, either Industrial Tribunal or take it through um, the County Court. Uh, that, that's the place to go because you've got a good argument there, but uh, your risk factors are a lot lower if you do that. I mean, particularly things like small claims. If you just keep hitting label with small claims cases, if they lose, they still don't get costs off you in small claims. So, you know, you can harry them with this, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're taking the exact same risk. I've sued them twice. It's cost them about 60,000 quid in costs that they didn't get back from me. They got 600 quid out of me so far. <clears throat> That's it. Um, and I beat them. Basically, they settled in both cases because they knew they were going to get their arse handed to them. So, and I'll keep doing it as well if they keep coming after me on stupid things. So you can win, but you've got to be tactical about it and think about and really carefully think about the risk reward in terms of cost as well. Thank you all. So... Thank you for our online contributors, Brian and Neil. Um, we'll be circulating um, well th this, this, this video and will be available online so that you'll be able to see the whole thing in due course. And I've got some links as well to send around, including the one that Naomi sent me. So this is a political, not a legal battle, but as Duncan said, go for small claims if you want to. Um, I think we've learned a lot about the history of the purges um, and need to move forward, obviously, in solidarity. So thank you all for coming today and see you later. Thank you.